to fast asleep, where we just tuck you in and take you far away from whatever happened in your day. You're going to be glad you stopped by. It's springtime here, and it's early fall in New Zealand, and that is where we're headed right now, New Zealand, to visit our friend Catherine Mansfield again. You can also visit her on Fast Asleep episodes. Get ready. 203, 165, 156, 146, and 147. That's a two-parter. Episodes 84 and episode 24. Did we miss any? Probably. We get it. Y'all love her. She is considered one of the most influential and important authors of the modernist movement. Well, as you know from earlier episodes, she was born in breathtakingly beautiful New Zealand. And she's been published in 25 languages. She was only 19 years old when she left New Zealand. And she wrote that she felt disillusioned and alienated there because of the repression of the Maori people, the native people of New Zealand. Fine, we get that one here in the U.S., don't we? I hope we do. Um, Ms. Mansfield first traveled to London, where she befriended D.H. Lawrence and Virginia Woolf, among many others. Her romantic relationships, if as we've said before, were with both men and women. She wrote and was published as she traveled throughout continental Europe. And now some negative stuff. At the age of 29, she was diagnosed with pulmonary tuberculosis. And this is what kept her from ever returning to New Zealand. Catherine Mansfield accomplished a great deal in a very short amount of time, thankfully, because tuberculosis took her life while in Paris at the very young age of 34. So let's celebrate her life now with two delicious stories drawn from her childhood tuck in everybody for the first story. It's The Doll's House by Catherine Mansfield. When dear old Mrs. Hay went back to town, after staying with the Burnells, she sent the children a doll's house. It was so big that the carter, delivery person, and Pat carried it into the courtyard and oof, there it stayed, propped up on two wooden boxes beside the feed room door. Well, no harm could come to it. It was summer. And perhaps the smell of paint would have gone off by the time it had to be taken in. For really, the smell of paint coming from that doll's house? Oh, sweet old Mrs. Hay, of course. Most sweet and generous, but ooh, the smell of paint was quite enough to make anyone seriously ill, in Aunt Burl's opinion. Even before the sacking was taken off, and when it was, there stood the doll's house, a dark oily spinach green, picked out with bright yellow. Its two solid little chimneys glued on to the roof were painted red and white, and the door, gleaming with yellow varnish, was like a little slab of toffee. Four windows real windows, were divided into panes by a broad streak of green. There was actually a tiny porch, too, painted yellow, with 
big lumps of congealed paint hanging along the edge. But perfect, a perfect little house. Who could possibly mind the smell? It was part of the joy, part of the newness. Open it quickly, someone! The hook at the side was stuck fast. Pat pried it open with his penknife, and the whole house front swung back. And there you were, gazing at one and the same moment into the drawing room and dining room, the kitchen, and two bedrooms. Oh, that is the way for a house to open. Why don't all houses open like that? How much more exciting than peering through the slit of a door into a mean little hall with a hat stand and two umbrellas. That is, isn't it, what you long to know about a house when you put your hand on the knocker? Perhaps it is the way God opens houses at dead of night when he is taking a quiet turn with an angel. Oh, oh, the Burnell children sounded as though they were in despair. It was too marvelous. It was too much for them. They had never seen anything like it in their lives. All the rooms were papered. There were pictures on the walls painted on the paper with gold frames complete. Red carpet covered all the floors except the kitchen. Red plush chairs in the drawing room. Green in the dining room. Tables. Beds with real bedclothes. A cradle. A stove. A dresser with tiny plates and one big jug. Oh, but what Kezia liked more than anything what she liked frightfully was the lamp it stood in the middle of the dining room table an exquisite little amber lamp with a white globe oh it was even filled all ready for lighting though of course you couldn't light it but there was something inside that looked like oil and that moved when you shook it. The father and mother dolls, who sprawled very stiff, as though they had fainted in the drawing room, and their two little children asleep upstairs, were really too big for the doll's house. They didn't look as though they belonged, but that lamp was perfect. It seemed to smile at Kezia, to say, I live here. The lamp was real. The Burnell children could hardly walk to school fast enough the next morning. They burned to tell everybody to describe, to, well, to boast about their doll's house before the school bell rang. I'm to tell, said Isabel, because I'm the eldest and... You two can join in after, but I'm to tell first. Well, there was nothing to answer. Isabel was bossy, but she was always right, and Lottie and Kezia knew too well the powers that went with being eldest. They brushed through the thick buttercups at the road edge and said nothing. And I'm to choose who's to come and see it, First, Mother said I might, for it had been arranged that while the doll's house stood in the courtyard, they might ask the girls at school, two at a time, to come and look, not to stay to tea, of course, or to come traipsing through the house, but just to stand quietly in the courtyard while Isabel pointed out the beauties, and Lottie and Kezia looked pleased. But, hurry as they might, by the time they had reached the tarred palings, the fence stakes of the boys' playground, the bell had begun to jangle. 
They only just had time to whip off their hats and fall into line before the roll was called. Never mind. Isabel tried to make up for it by looking very important and mysterious and by whispering behind her hand to the girls near her. I got something to tell you at playtime. Playtime came and Isabel was surrounded. The girls of her class nearly fought to put their arms around her, to walk away with her, to beam flatteringly, to be her special friend. Oh, she held quite a court under the huge pine trees at the side of the playground. Nudging, giggling together, the little girls pressed up close, and the only two who stayed outside the ring were the two who were always outside. The little Kelvies. They knew better than to come anywhere near the Burnells. For the fact was, the school the Burnell children went to was not at all the kind of place their parents would have chosen if there had been any choice, but there was none. It was the only school for miles, and the consequence was all the children in the neighborhood, the judges' little girls, the doctor's daughters, the storekeeper's children, the milkman's, were forced to mix together. Not to speak of there being an equal number of rude, rough little boys as well. But the line had to be drawn somewhere. It was drawn at the Kelvies. Many of the children, including the Burnells, were not allowed even to speak to them. They walked past the Kelvies with their heads in the air, and as they set the fashion in all matters of behavior, the Kelvies were shunned by everybody. Even the teacher had a special voice for them and a special smile for the other children when Lil Kelvy came up to her desk with a bunch of dreadfully common-looking flowers. They were the daughters of a spry, hard-working little washerwoman who went about from house to house by the day. Oh, this was awful enough. But where was Mr. Kelvy? Nobody knew for certain, but everybody said he was in prison. So they were the daughters of a washerwoman and a jailbird. Very nice company for other people's children. And they looked it. Why Mrs. Kelvy made them so conspicuous was hard to understand. The truth was, they were dressed in bits given to her by the people for whom she worked. Lil, for instance, was a stout, plain child with big freckles. She came to school in a dress made from a green art serge, woven wool tablecloth of the Burnells, with red plush sleeves from the Logan's curtains. Her hair and her hat, oh, her hat, was perched on top of her high forehead. It was a grown-up woman's hat, once the property of Miss Lecky, the postmistress. It turned up at the back and was trimmed with a large scarlet quill. What a little guy, she looked, meaning, well, it's a British term for an odd-looking person. It was impossible not to laugh. And her little sister, our Else, wore a long white dress, rather like a nightgown, and a pair of little boy's boots. But whatever our Else wore, she would have looked strange, she was a tiny wishbone of a child with cropped hair and enormous 
solemn eyes. A little white owl. Nobody had ever seen her smile. Well, she scarcely ever spoke. She went through life holding on to Lil with a piece of Lil's skirt screwed up in her hand. Where Lil went, our else followed. In the playground, on the road going to and from school, there was Lil marching in front and our else holding on behind. Only when she wanted anything or when she was out of breath, our else gave Lil a tug, a twitch, and Lil stopped and turned around. Oh, the Kelvies never failed to understand each other. Now, they hovered at the edge. You couldn't stop them listening. And when the little girls turned around and sneered, Lil, as usual, gave her silly, shamefaced smile. But our else only looked. And Isabel's voice, so very proud, went on telling, Oh, the carpet made a great sensation. But so did the beds with real bedclothes and the stove with an oven door. When she finished, Kezia broke in. You've forgotten the lamp, Isabel. Oh, yes said Isabel, and there's a teeny little lamp all made of yellow glass with a white globe that stands on the dining room table. <laughs> you couldn't tell it from a real one. The lamp's best of all, cried Kezia. She thought Isabel wasn't making half enough of that little lamp, but nobody paid attention. Isabel was choosing the two who were to come back with them that afternoon and see it. She chose Emmy Cole and Lena Logan. But when the others knew they were all to have a chance, oh, they couldn't be nice enough to Isabel. One by one, they put their arms round Isabel's waist and walked off with her. They had something to whisper to her, a secret. Isabel's my friend. Only the little Kelvies moved away, forgotten. There was nothing more for them to hear. Days passed, and as more children saw the doll's house, oh, the fame of it spread. It became the one subject, the rage. The one question was, Have you seen Burnell's doll's house? Oh, ain't it lovely? Haven't you seen it? Oh, I say. Even the dinner hour was given up to talking about it. The little girls sat under the pines, eating their thick mutton sandwiches and big slabs of Johnny cake spread with butter. While always, as near as they could get, sat the Kelvies, our else holding on to Lil, listening too, while they chewed their jam sandwiches out of a newspaper soaked with large red blobs. Mother, said Kezia, can, can't I ask the Kelvies just once? Oh, certainly not, Kezia. But why not? Run away, Kezia. You know quite well why not. At last, everybody had seen it, except them. On that day, ah, the subject rather flagged. It was the dinner hour. The children stood together under the pine trees, and suddenly, as they looked at the Kelvies eating out of their paper, always by themselves, always listening, they wanted to be horrid to them. Emmy Cole started the whisper. Lil Kelvies going to be a servant when she grows up. <gasps> oh, how awful, said Isabel Burnell, and she made eyes at Emmy. 
Emmy swallowed in a very meaning way and nodded to Isabel, as she'd seen her mother do on those occasions. It's true, it's true, it's true, she said. Then Lena Logan's little eyes snapped. Shall I ask her? she whispered. I bet you don't, said Jessie May. I'm not frightened, said Lena. Suddenly, she gave a little squeal and danced in front of the other girls. Watch! Watch me! Watch me now! said Lena, and sliding, gliding, dragging one foot, giggling behind her hand, Lena went over to the Kelvies. Lil looked up from her dinner. Oh, she wrapped the rest quickly away. Our else stopped chewing. Mm, what was coming now? Is it true you're going to be a servant when you grow up, Lil Kelvy? Shrilled Lena. Dead silence. But instead of answering, Lil only gave her a silly, shame faced smile. She didn't seem to mind the question at all. <laughs> what a sell for Lena! the girls began to titter. Oh, Lena couldn't stand that. She put her hands on her hips. She shot forward. Yeah, your father's in prison, she hissed spitefully. This was such a marvelous thing to have said that the little girls rushed away in a body, deeply, deeply excited, wild with joy. Someone found a long rope, and they began skipping. <laughs> and never did they skip so high, run in and out so fast, or do such daring things as on that morning. In the afternoon, Pat called for the Burnell children with the buggy, and they drove home. There were visitors. Isabel and Lottie, who liked visitors, went upstairs to change their pinafores. But Kezia thieved out at the back. Nobody was about. She began to swing on the big white gates of the courtyard. Presently, looking along the road, she saw two little dots. Hmm. They grew bigger. They were coming towards her. Now she could see that one was in front and one close behind. Now she could see that they were the Kelvies. Kezia stopped swinging. She slipped off the gate as if she was going to run away, and then she hesitated. The Kelvies came nearer, and beside them, walked their shadows, very long, stretching right across the road with their heads in the buttercups. Kezia clambered back on the gate. She had made up her mind. She swung out. Hello, she said to the passing Kelvies. Ooh, they were so astounded that they stopped. Lil gave her silly smile. Our else stared. You can come and see our doll's house uh, if you want to, said Kezia, and she dragged one toe on the ground. But at that, oh, Lil turned red and shook her head quickly. Why not? asked Kezia. Lil gasped. Then she said, oh, Your ma told our ma you wasn't to speak to us. Oh, well said Kezia, and she didn't know what to reply. It doesn't matter. You can come and see our doll's house all the same. Come on, nobody's looking. But Lil shook her head still harder. Ah, uh, don't you want to? asked Kezia. Suddenly there was a twitch, a tug at Lil's skirt. She turned round. Our else was looking at her with big, imploring eyes. She was frowning. She wanted to go. 
for a moment. Lil looked at our else very doubtfully. But then our else twitched her skirt again, and she started forward. Kezia led the way. Like two little stray cats, they followed across the courtyard to where the doll's house stood. There it is, said Kezia. There was a pause. Lil breathed loudly, <laughs> almost snorted. Our else was still a stone. I'll open it for you, said Kezia kindly. She undid the hook and they looked inside. There's the drawing room and um, the dining room and that's the Kezia. Oh, what a start they gave. Kezia. It was Aunt Burl's voice. They turned round. At the back door stood Aunt Burl, staring as if she couldn't believe what she saw. Oh, how dare you ask the little Kelvies into the courtyard, she said with her cold, furious voice. You know as well as I do, you're not allowed to talk to them. Run away, children, run away at once, and don't you come back again, said Aunt Burl. And she stepped into the yard and shooed them out as if they were chickens. Off! Off you go immediately, she called, cold and proud. Well, they did not need telling twice, burning with shame, shrinking together, Lil huddling along like her mother, our else dazed. Somehow they crossed the big courtyard and squeezed through the white gate. Oh, wicked, disobedient little girl, said Aunt Burl bitterly to Kezia. And she slammed the doll's house, too. The afternoon had been awful. A letter had come from Willie Brent, a terrifying threatening letter saying if she did not meet him that evening in Pullman's bush, he'd come to the front door and ask the reason why. But now that she had frightened those little rats of Kelvies and given Kezia a good scolding, her heart felt better. That ghastly pressure was gone. She went back to the house Humming. When the Kelvies were well out of sight of the Burnells, they sat down to rest on a big red drain pipe by the side of the road. Oof, Lil's cheeks were still burning. She took off the hat with the quill and held it on her knee. (laughs) Dreamily, they looked over the hay paddocks, past the creek, to the group of wattles, acacia trees, where Logan's cows stood, waiting to be milked. What were their thoughts? Hmm. Presently, our else nudged up close to her sister. Now? Oh, she'd forgotten the cross lady. She put out a finger and stroked her sister's quill. She smiled, her rare smile. I seen the little lamp, she said softly. Then both were silent once more. Please stay with us 
for today's second story from Catherine Mansfield, right after this. There's a very promising opportunity waiting for you, and it's time you took advantage of it. It's time you stop talking about starting a podcast and start doing something about it. It's easy. You can do it with Spotify. Yes, now there's Spotify for podcasters. <laughs> you can make a podcast, distribute that podcast, and earn money for it. All with Spotify. And it's free. Here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating right now. And then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Even video podcasts are available on Spotify. Hey, they've made it easy for me, and it'll be easy for you, too. You've got nothing to lose. It really is completely free. Just download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters. That's www.spotify. Dot com forward slash podcasters. And come on, let's get this whole thing started. I can't wait to listen to you for a change. Now, as you listen to this next tale... Please, try not to be jaded by today's society. Just allow yourself to enjoy the sweet ending of this next story. It's The Little Girl by Catherine Mansfield. girl. He was a figure to be feared and avoided. Every morning before going to business, he came into the nursery and gave her a perfunctory kiss, to which she responded with, Goodbye, father. And oh, the glad sense of relief when she heard the noise of the buggy growing fainter and fainter down the long road. In the evening, leaning over the banisters at his homecoming, she heard his loud voice in the hall. Bring my tea into the smoking room. Oh, hasn't the paper come yet? Have they taken it into the kitchen again? Mother, go and see if my paper's out there. And bring me my slippers. Cass! Mother would call to her. If you're a good girl, you can come down and take off father's boots. Slowly, the girl would slip down the stairs, holding tightly to the banisters with one hand, more slowly still, across the hall and push open the smoking room door. Well, by that time, he had his spectacles on and looked at her over them in a way that was terrifying to the little girl. Well, Cass, get a move on and pull these boots off and take them outside. You been a good girl today? I d d d d don't know, Father. You d d d don't know. Now, if you stutter like that, Mother will have to take you to the doctor. Well, she never stuttered with other people. She'd quite given it up. But only with Father, because then, well, she was trying so hard to say the words properly. What's the matter? Why are you looking so wretched? Mother, I wish you would teach this child not to appear on the, the brink of suicide. 
Here, Cass, carry my teacup back to the table. Carefully, oh, your hands jog like an old lady's. And, oh, try to keep your handkerchief in your pocket, not up your sleeve. Yes, Father. On Sundays, she sat in the same pew with him in church, listening while he sang in a loud, clear voice, watching while he made little notes during the sermon, with the stump of a blue pencil on the back of an envelope, his eyes narrowed to a slit, one hand beating a silent tattoo on the pew ledge. He said his prayers so loudly. She was certain God heard him above the clergyman. He was so big, his hands and his neck, especially his mouth when he yawned. Thinking about him alone in the nursery was like thinking about a giant. On Sunday afternoons, Grandmother sent her down to the drawing room, dressed in her brown velvet, to have a nice talk with Father and Mother. But the little girl always found Mother reading the sketch, and Father stretched out on the couch, his handkerchief on his face, his feet propped on one of the best sofa pillows and so soundly sleeping that (laughs) he snored. She, perched on the piano stool, gravely watched him until he woke and stretched and asked the time and then looked at her. Oh, well, don't stare so, Cass. (laughs) You look like a little brown owl. One day, When she was kept indoors with a cold, the grandmother told her that father's birthday was next week and suggested she should make him a pincushion for a present out of a beautiful piece of yellow silk. Laboriously, with a double cotton, that's a heavy cotton fabric, the little girl stitched three sides. But hmm, what to fill it with? Well, that was the question. The grandmother was out in the garden, and she wandered into Mother's bedroom to look for scraps. Hmm. On the bedside table, she discovered a great many sheets of fine paper, gathered them up and shredded them into tiny pieces, and stuffed her case, and then sewed up the fourth side. Oh, that night... There was a hue and cry over the house. Father's great speech for the harbor board had been lost. Rooms were ransacked, servants questioned, and finally Mother came into the nursery. Oh, Cass, I suppose you didn't see some papers on a table in our room? Oh, yes, she said. I tore them up for my surprise. Oh, what? screamed Mother. Oh, you come straight down to the dining room this instant. And she was dragged down to where Father was pacing to and fro, hands behind his back. Well, sharply, Mother explained. He stopped and stared in a stupefied manner at the child. Did you do that? No, she whispered. Mother, Go up to the nursery and fetch down the damn thing and see that that child is put to bed this instant. Crying, too much to explain, she lay in the shadowed room watching the evening light sift through the Venetian blinds and trace a sad little pattern on the floor. And then father came into the room with a ruler in his hands. I am going to whip you for this, he said. Oh, no, no, she screamed, cowering down under the bedclothes. He pulled them aside. Sit up, he commanded, and uh, hold out your hands. You must be taught once and for all not to touch what does not belong to you. But it was for your birthday. Down came the ruler. 
on her little pink palms. Hours later, when the grandmother had wrapped her in a shawl and rocked her in the rocking chair, the child cuddled close to her soft body. <laughs> what did Jesus make fathers for? She sobbed. Here's a clean hanky, darling, with some of my lavender water on it. Oh, go to sleep, pet. You'll forget all about it in the morning. Ah, I tried to explain to father, but he was too upset to listen tonight. But the child never forgot. Next time she saw him, Oh, she whipped both hands behind her back. A red color flew into her cheeks. The McDonald's lived in the next door house. Five children there were. Looking through a hole in the vegetable garden fence, the little girl saw them playing tag in the evening. The father, with the baby Mac, on his shoulders, and two little girls hanging onto his coattails, ran round and round the flower beds, shaking with laughter. Once, she saw the boys turn the hose on him. Turn the hose on him! Oh! And he made a great grab at them, tickling them until they got hiccups. <laughs> then it was... She decided there were different sorts of fathers. Suddenly, one day, Mother became ill, and she and Grandmother drove into town in a closed carriage. The little girl was left alone in the house with Alice, the general. <laughs> now, that was all right in the daytime, but while Alice was putting her to bed... She grew suddenly afraid. Oh, uh, what'll I do? If I have a nightmare, she asked. I often have nightmares, and then Granny takes me into her bed. I, I can't stay in the dark. It gets all whispery. What'll I do if I, if I do? Well, you're just going to go to sleep, child, said Alice pulling off her socks and whacking them against the bed rail. And don't you holler out and wake your poor pa. But the same old nightmare came. The butcher with a knife and a rope who grew nearer and nearer, smiling that dreadful smile while she could not move, could only stand still, crying out, Grandma! Grandma! She woke, shivering, to see Father beside her bed, a candle in his hand. What's the matter? he said. Oh, a butcher, a knife, I want Granny. He blew out the candle, bent down, and caught up the child in his arms, carrying her along the passage to the big bedroom. A newspaper was on the bed, a half-smoked cigar balanced against his reading lamp. Oh, he pitched the paper on the floor, threw the cigar into the fireplace, then carefully tucked up the child. He lay down beside her, half asleep still, still with the butcher's smile all about her, it seemed. She crept close to him, snuggled her head under his arm, held tightly to his pajama jacket, and then the dark did not matter. She lay still. Here, rub your feet against my legs and get them warm, said Father. Tired out, he slept before the little girl. 
a funny feeling came over her. Hmm. Poor father. Not so big after all. And with no one to look after him. He was harder than the grandmother, but it was a nice hardness. And every day he had to work and was too tired to be a Mr. MacDonald. She had torn up all his beautiful writing. She stirred suddenly and sighed. Well, what was the matter? asked Father. Another dream? Oh, said the little girl. <laughs> My head's on your heart. I can hear it going. What a big heart you've got, Father dear. Good night.